everybody. Thanks for having me to, to talk here. And I want you to wake up because FRBs are happening. Like for real, every couple seconds, they're like happening in the sky. Um, and radio telescopes right now are just scrambling to detect these things. Um, only a few of them have detected them. But there are a lot of telescopes getting online and, and getting on sky to, to detect them even further. But even so, we're just at the tip of the iceberg of discovery. And really, I wanted to frame this overview talk on fast radio bursts with two questions, which is first, what are they? And second, what can we use them for? This is a, these are the two questions that people are working on in, in fast radio bursts at the moment. So let's get straight into it. Here is a fast radio burst. You can see this really great detection of a fairly bright fast radio burst. This is about a signal to noise of 50. I'm showing you a spectrogram here. This is a frequency uh, dependent arrival time. And what you see is that the, the pulse is swept in frequency. And this is, follows a fairly precisely um, a frequency to the minus two delay with frequency. And you could see that the, the magnitude of that delay is, is quantified by the dispersion measure. If you try to describe this delay as a cold plasma dispersion, um, you can quantify um, the dispersion measure by integrating along the line of sight for your source out to the distance of the burst. Um, I've washed out some redshift factors here just for simplicity. Um, the idea of this is, of course, that using the dispersion measure measured for these fast radio bursts, you can either measure the electro electron density along the line of sight or the distance to the burst. Um, you get one or the other. The other really interesting thing about fast radio burst detections that we've seen in the past few years is that you see this nice characteristic fast rise and exponential tail in the light curves. And you can see the light curve at, at three different frequencies there. Um, the frequency dependent width of the burst also follows a frequency dependent um, uh, term. And this particular burst has frequency to the minus four, which agrees very well with what we see in things like pulsars, where we see scattering. This is just multipath scattering, um, pushing light to later times. So I'm just going to first start with a general overview of what's been detected for fast radio bursts. Uh, at this point, I think we're doing pretty well because there's only six unpublished bursts at the moment. Um, so 23 sources have been detected, 17 published. You can see the telescopes that have detected them. Uh, there's been two very recently announced on that good old science journal Facebook um, from Malonglo. Uh, burst at the uh, Green Bank Telescope, uh, one at Arecibo, although that one is repeating, as um, Vicky will talk about in the next talk and a huge number of bursts at Parkes Radio Telescope. Uh, I'm showing you a, a couple of different examples of light curves. This is corrected for the dispersion, so integrated along that dispersion curve. Um, and you can see that they, they follow a variety of shapes. Uh, the top one is probably instrumentally dominated. You can see that it's, it's fairly well resolved. Um, the second one you can see is, has a nice fast rise exponential tail. That third one there is, is double peaked. So they, they have a bit of variety in their phenomenology. On the right on the plot, I'm showing you the distribution of the widths of fast radio bursts in reference to pulsars, which are the other fast transients in the radio sky, um, and the, the repeating radio burst. Um, and I just wanted to show the fact that, in fact, fast radio bursts are approximately the same distribution um, to pulsars. However, this plot doesn't account for instrumental broadening effects, which actually push the width, the measured width, the fast radio bursts broader. Um, so in fact, that FRB curve will move to the left um, if that was a properly accounted for. So within the same range of pulsars, however, not quite following the same distribution. So far, we've only detected these around um, L-band, which we refer to as uh, 0.7 to 1.5 gigahertz. Um, the rates of these bursts are debated, but somewhere in the range of 2,500 to 10,000 in the sky per day, hence maybe one around every eight to 16 seconds. About 50% of them have been observed to be scattered. So how do we identify an FRB? Um, that's what I'm trying to show in this plot. On the y-axis, I'm showing what I'm saying is the dispersion excess. So this is the excess beyond what we would expect from dispersion occur, um, occurring in the Milky Way. So if we put a, a burster behind the Milky Way, it will have DMMW. Um, and we see DMs beyond that for fast radio bursts. Um, so this is as a function of the dispersion measure measured um, for each pulse. And you can see that pulsars, as we would expect, they're all mostly in our galaxy. There's a sort of northern arm there, which is the small and large Magellanic clouds. And you can see that the fast radio bursts in red are extending well up into something like 70 times what you would expect from the Milky Way contribution. Um, I've also plotted here uh, rat single pulses. Rats are rotating radio transients. 
a different type of, of neutron star pheno phenomenon. Um, these are these have been called rats, but bursted only once, so I thought I would display them just to show that these appear to be within the galaxy. We just expect them to be galactic neutron stars. Now you can see that there's also a few pulsars that are laying just above um, a ratio of one. So these are not, we expect, extragalactic pulsars, but in fact, just the effect that the electron density model we have for our galaxy is not quite perfect. So I'm calling this the NE2001 danger zone. NE2001 is the standard model most of us use for distance estimation for dispersion. Um, I'm showing again the repeater here. I put it right at the edge of the danger zone because as Vicky will show that repeater is in fact believed to be an extragalactic source and not a galactic one. Now I wanted to show you Another peculiar observed property of fast radio bursts, um, and I know an important aspect of gamma ray burst source identification was looking at their sky distribution and showing that in fact there was a isotropic sky distribution. What's funny about fast radio bursts is that you can already see here that there seems to be some kind of deficit in the galactic plane. Um, and this becomes even more prevalent when you think about the fact that we've surveyed the galactic plane over and over again for pulsars. And pulsar surveys do great as fast radio burst finding surveys. Um, so this is a somewhat old analysis and needs to be redone with, with the newer detections. Um, but I'm just showing you the, uh, the rates of detection here in the galactic plane versus high latitudes. And it's a factor of something like six difference. Um, there's been huge numbers of hours spent in the galactic plane surveying um, and only a limited number off the galactic plane. And we've already found 10, 10 fast radio bursts by the time this was published. Um, this is about a four sigma result. So it might swing either way as we, we look to the future. Now, there's a deficit in the plane, but in fact, this is expected from an extragalactic population. Um, and I'm showing here just the relative detection rate you would expect to see for a particular instrument, in this case, the Parkes multi-beam survey. Um, and you would expect to actually have a drop in the galactic plane, and this is due to excessive scattering and excessive dispersion that occurs in the galaxy. And also just the fact that you have material there so that the sky temperature is a little bit higher. When you point there, you're less sensitive. Um, but all these factors lead to more instrumental broadening, and then less sensitivity in the galactic plane. Um, in fact, these mo the NE2001 model again went into to making this plot, and it's not quite enough to show that we should have detected a little bit more actually in the galactic plane. Um, and McCourt and Johnston have gone back and said, well, maybe this extra um, contribution is in fact due to scintillation. Um, so, this, in addition to uh, the excessive dispersion seen by fast radio bursts, um, has led most people to say that, in fact, fast radio bursts are extragalactic. Um, now, if that's true, the question is begged, what can we use them for? And I'm showing here a couple of different ideas for what people have come up with in the literature. Um, the one most people talk about uh, tends to be doing a baryonic census. So because we can get the integrated line of sight um, electron density of the intergalactic medium, if this thing is out at a redshift of one, we've measured the electron density along the line of sight. Um, and if we could do that, we can in fact perhaps locate the missing baryons that have um, been shown to, to not exist in a way. Um, people have shown how um, a measurement of the delay of the fast radio burst with frequency can actually put mass uh, constraints on the photon. Um, we could do things like measure intergalactic magnetism um, the, the magnetism of just the IGM along the line of sight, and a, a huge number of other really exciting things just with the source itself. So this is a coherent emission process. It's very short bursts, um, extreme and rare events. These things are very far away. It must be very bright. Um, and we could also potentially measure intergalactic medium turbulence. Now I've highlighted in green the fact that you actually need to have a redshift measurement, a distance measurement, to get any science really out of fast radio bursts. Um, and that includes photon mass constraints. Um, but not only that, but you need to know what the contribution is of the host galaxy and any progenitor that the fast radio burst is sitting in, so you can decouple that from the intergalactic medium. And that brings us to our really most important question at this point, which is, what are they? What are fast radio bursts? And as many people rightfully point out, it's not what, but at this point, where? So we know that we're sitting in a galaxy. We know that the fast radio burst we don't know it, but we assume they're probably not sitting out in, in blank space. Um, there must be some kind of material to actually send out this radio emission. There is some sort of intergalactic medium these propagate through, a host galaxy potentially, and a progenitor um, material. 
Now, if we take the excess dispersion and assign it all to the intergalactic medium, you can see that um, you can take a model of the universe, which is just sort of 75-25, um, hydrogen and helium, fully ionize it, and see how far you could get the fast radio burst before it runs out of dispersion. Uh, and you can see that the, the fast radio bursts, if you do this, tend to lie above a redshift of maybe 0.4, um, up to fairly high redshift, and the, the keen-eyed will see a new burst in the mix there that might be really exciting, but I'm not gonna talk about it. Now, if you attribute 50% of the excesses to the, um, to the intergalactic medium, therefore the other 50% sitting in the, either the progenitor or the host galaxy, or maybe even something in our, in our own galaxy, you can see that the fast radio bursts shift down. Um, so it's not quite constrained where these are. And the biggest problem is, at this point, there's a lot of information that we just don't have, and very critical information, in particular localization. Uh, and this is primarily because the, fa the telescopes that have detected fast radio bursts and that are really efficient at detecting fast radio bursts tend to be single dishes. Um, and this also leads to unreliable flux measurements, um, flux density and influence measurements, and spectral indices, because if you detect a fast radio burst with a single dish, you don't quite know where it is in your, um, in your point spread function. It's going to be some arbitrarily scaling up for the, the flux and the spectral index. We also don't know any currently multi-wavelength signatures, although I'll talk a little bit about this in a few slides. Um, and just to, just to highlight the fact that we really can't localize these things yet, um, I'm showing on the upper right the d telescopes, the localization regions of the telescopes that have detected fast radio bursts. Um, I work on the VLA, so I checked it in there because I think it's a great instrument, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little at the end of the talk. Um, but you can see that the number of galaxies within these fields, this is the Hubble Deep Field, just showing, you know, this blank patch of sky contains many, many, many galaxies. We have some constraints on the distance, so we know roughly what volume the galaxy, host galaxies might be sitting in. Um, but to actually confident, confidently associate one of these transients to a host galaxy is n close to impossible, um, unless you have some really extraordinary evidence for um, related multi-wavelength emission within the beam. On the other hand, we have a ton of information just because radio waves going through any type of plasma um, experience a, a number of, of effects. Of course, dispersion measure is, is the one we, we first noticed. Um, we've started to now measure polarization for fast radio bursts, so we get things like rotation measure, um, we get polarization fraction and angle. Um, all of these explore both the source characteristics and uh, the medium and the magnetic fields in the medium. So just a, a large number of things which help us disentangle one effect from the other um, in terms of where the, the material is along the line of sight and uh, what's contributing what. So just looking at the meta, um, meta properties of fast radio bursts, um, here I'm, I have a slide about just the local environment. So if you take the entire population we've detected on average, what can we say about it? So the first thing is that of course, we've detected this with radio emission. And what happens that is that if you have something like a supernova shell around a fast radio burst source, initially, at the beginning of the supernova, it's far too dense to actually allow the, the um, emission to pass. So you, you experience free-free absorption um, and potentially complete free-free absorption within that shell. So the progenitor, progenitor environment has to be diffuse enough to let out a one gigahertz signal. Um, Jonathan Katz will talk more about this, I think, but you would actually expect to um, see deviations um, from certain uh, parameter space of density uh, for, for the dispersion relation. So it'll deviate from dt uh, going as f to the minus two. Uh, and Sri Kulkarni has pointed out, along with others, that uh, if you have a, even just a moderate optical depth um, in, um, in the surrounding medium, uh, you really get a drastically rising spectrum uh, expected for, for radio pulses. We have a few spectral index limits. Spectral index is not something that's very well constrained, again, because we have single dish detections. Um, but a number of experiments have tried to operate at lower and much higher frequencies than one gigahertz and put general constraints on, on fast radio bursts. So you can see that, on average, we don't expect the spectral index of them to be much lower than about 0.1, down to low frequencies, and much higher than about 4.0. Now, I'm gonna move on to a couple of individual FRBs and look at their properties and what they say about just that FRB. 
Uh, and I'm showing here a plot um, by Sri Kulkarni back in 2014. He did an analysis of what we call the Lorimer burst. This was the, the first reported uh, radio burst. Um, it had a DM excess of about 300. It was detected in the direction of the small Magellanic cloud. Um, and what he did here was try to put constraints on both the size of the ionizing screen and the distance to the ionizing screen. Um, and you could do this because uh, if you assume, for instance, uh, the fast radio burst is occurring within a star, you can have a predicted emission measure um, for the, the material around it uh, and put constraints based on the, the dispersion measure that you actually observe. And you could see that the constraints for this particular burst, um, based on ob observed surveys and based on physics for the, the free free absorption uh, line there, the constraints actually push the fast radio burst well outside of our galaxy um, and really constrain the ionizing screen to be fairly large. So um, Shri was arguing for a fairly diffuse screen in this case for this burst. If you look at the polarization of radio bursts, there's been a couple coming out now. Um, the first published polarization light curve uh, is seen here. So the, the, um, the white curve is, is Stokes I and the linear polarizations are in uh, purple and blue and then circular polarization is seen in yellow. Now you'll see that the circular polarization is detected in this case whereas linear polarization was not. Um, we were not able to detect any, any in this case. And there were two interpretations of this. First, this could be an intrinsic effect. The source is intrinsically like pulsars are occasionally um, dominated by circular polarization just exhibiting no linear polarization. In this case, it's, it's a probably a magnetar-like uh, source um, potentially. Within, therefore, because magnetars can't be too far away before we can't see them anymore, um, within some kind of local relatively diffuse environmental influence. <clears throat> On the other hand, this could uh, be a burst that's that is highly polarized in linear polarization, um, but is in fact experiencing depolarization. Uh, but to make that happen, you have to have a rotation measure which is absolutely enormous, so 10 to the 4 radians per, per square meter. Um, in that case, you would also have a local, probably much more dense environment influence. Um, but because the DM excess is, is relatively high, it is hard to get that much density to get such a high rotation measure. I think the better example, though, of polarization in the past few years um, that has come out was from the Green Bank Telescope burst, and that's what I'm showing here by Masui and collaborators. So on the upper right, I'm showing the light curve again of the, um, the Stokes I polarization and then the, the linear and, um, and circular polarization. Below that, I'm showing the position angle of the polarization as you go across in time. Um, on the bottom left, you can see the frequency dependence of these. And you'll notice first that there's this really nice sort of sinusoidal ripples. Um, now, GBT was scanning when it detected this burst, so that drop in Stokes I with frequency is not interpreted as a spectral index, but in fact just the fact that you were probably scanning across the source. Um, so you see a dampening of the, the source at, um, at higher frequency. So the, the signature of Faraday rotation in data like this is actually expected to look as it is there, as it does there. Um, so you can see the rotation of the vector as it goes across with frequency. Um, and the, the, the rotation measure that was measured for this burst was also fairly large, about negative 186 uh, radians per square meter. Now you can look at the contribution you would expect from the galaxy, which we have reasonably good modeling for, uh, and you get 18. Uh, and you can predict a maximum contribution from the intergalactic medium, uh, which is only about 6 radians per square meter. So what was argued for this burst was in fact that the contribution from the Milky Way and the IGM was insufficient to support such a large rotation measure. So there must be something um, surrounding this, um, this object to have caused a rotation measure that high. Now if you look at the rotation, um, the, the magnetic field measured for this rotation measure and the DM, it's fairly small, I think it's something like 0.38. Um, and I know that Jonathan Katz will talk about that more in, in, a couple, uh, in a couple talks. But I wanted to point out a few more interesting properties of this source, um, which really reveal a lot about where it's sitting and, and where it lives and how far it might be. So you can see that beyond the, the standard uh, drop there for that uh, frequency dependent Stokes I, you can see some ripples around this. And this was interpreted as a scintillation bandwidth, so there's some kind of decorrelation going on. 
Um, and the, the decorrelation bandwidth was detected to be about one megahertz for this burst. Now we expect decorrelation bandwidth if there's just a single um, decorrelating screen. We just, we'd expect it to be uh, proportional to one over two pi times the, um, the scattering time scale tau. And you could see that in fact the scattering, scattering time scale there is something like five milliseconds, which is not the one microsecond that you would expect to have gotten from something with this, um, this size of decorrelation bandwidth. Um, so this was interpreted to say that in fact most likely there's two scattering screens, one relatively near the source, um, with, coupled with arguments of the rotation measure, and one actually coming from our own galaxy, um, which if you look at nearby pulsars to the source, you get an, again a, a decorrelation bandwidth of about one megahertz. So moving along, the last thing I really got excited about for this burst was the fact that the polarization angle is actually changing with time over the sweep of this burst. Now we see this a lot in pulsars, and it's usually interpreted by something called the rotating vector model. In other words, there's some kind of change in magnetic field with time, that's what this tells us. Um, in pulsars, that's just because you have a, a rotating source, which uh, the magnetic field, you see different uh, lines of sight through its, its vectors. So something is changing with time, perhaps that means this is rotating, perhaps it means some kind of other dynamical effect or intrinsic effect, we're not sure yet, um, yet, to, be, yet to be found out. Now I'm gonna just send out some rumors here. There have been a lot more detections of polarization. Um, they're gonna be published. FRBs don't follow any standard for you know, linear, circular, or nothing. Some of them are just not polarized, which, fine. They, they swing about the same that, that pulsars do. Um, position angles have been observed to change in other sources. Um, I think this one is perhaps the most drastic. And for some objects, we actually see a rotation measure deficit. So you look in the direction of what you would expect to um, see for the Milky Way, in the direction of that fast radio burst plus the IGM for that DM, but actually the rotation measure is much, much less than, than that. So again, that argues for some kind of cancellation, um, so rotation measure can go up and down depending on magnetic field. Um, some kind of cancellation, so again, argues for a local medium influencing that burst. So I'd like to mention two exciting developments. One of them is the report of a potential FRB host galaxy, and you're seeing here the Parkes multi-beam beam pattern, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, and you see a nice little galaxy sitting there among those nice thousands of galaxies within that beam. Now the reason this galaxy was highlighted is that because initially, and that plot is a little hard to see on this screen, initially it was seen um, a flare coming out of that galaxy, which then declined with time. Um, and rightfully, Williams and Berger uh, have gone back to that source and looked at it with the VLA and actually demonstrated that the source is varying with time continuously <laughs> rather than just a single isolated flare. Um, others have gone back and, and demonstrated that this is in fact consistent with, um, with scintillation, um, re refractive scintillation probably in our own galaxy. Um, and I'm showing here a new result um, that is just being prepared now where we have um, we have VLBA observations of the host galaxy showing that it is right, in fact, just in the, at the center. So it's probably a scintillating AGN. So I'm just gonna cross out my subtitle there. Probably not an FRB host galaxy. But I think this really does highlight the fact that a large beam will not get you much in terms of confidence in your detection. Um, exciting development two, I'm just not gonna say anything about because Vicky's gonna talk about it in a moment. But this is a repeating FR, FRB. Um, and I guess I'll say a few things, okay. So until now we've all argued for cataclysmic events for fast radio bursts. Um, we expected them to go off once, never happen again. A repeating FRB just clearly argues against that. I think that's, that's all I'll say about this. Um, so let's get back to what are FRBs, now that we have seen a little bit about, about what they are. So you can think about this in terms of constraints on the progenitors, so redshifts, if you just distribute everything to the intergalactic medium, it might be up to a few, maybe about three uh, is the highest FRB known, redshift of three. Um, the emission region, just because these are short pulses, has to be fairly, fairly small. That's maybe not surprising to anyone. Um, it must be a coherent non-thermal source to have the brightness temperature we see. Um, and this, uh, this limit is assuming they are just simply extragalactic. So even if they're relatively nearby, the brightness temperature is absolutely enormous. Avoiding the galactic plane, this is an important aspect of this. 
And again, rates is something that a lot of folks have argued against or for various origins for FRBs, because these rates are huge compared to known cataclysmic events. Um, and perhaps also pointing to potential repetitions for FRBs. Um, okay, I'm gonna go real fast. So IgM and host progenitor contributions, they must balance a lot of different information we have from the radio propagation effects. So potentially, there could be more than one progenitor for radio bursts. However, currently nobody is, is really arguing that strongly because we just don't have enough data. Um, here's a number of progenitors in the literature. They run from you know, pretty standard things like smash two things together and put out a burst. You know, neutron stars make bursts. Hey, why don't, why don't these be neutron stars? You know, right down to unconventional theory number 37. There's, there's a, lot of, a lot of theories out there. Um, and the, the joke is always that we have more, more theories than bursts. So we obviously need more information. So what's the road ahead? Um, how do we get out of small number statistics and this muck of you know, over-interpreting the meager data we have? So first, finding high energy counterparts will really be key to understanding the environment of the fast radio burst, even though we have a lot of information from the radio itself. Host galaxy identification, if we can localize a, a, a fast radio burst, we'll know what galaxy it came from, it's simple as that. Um, and detailed radio properties and statistics, you know, working with you know, two dozen fast radio bursts, it gets you so far, but can't get you a really confident statement on much. Um, so in practical terms, this really means real-time detection. Um, this has been a problem because computation is a really big issue in detecting FRBs. Um, localization, and of course, just pushing for higher detection rates. Um, I'm gonna skip this. This is our, our informer for fast radio bursts. If we get a burst, we get an email. Um, so this is just one example of a real-time detection which allowed us to do follow-up um, at different wavelengths, and you can see the limits put here. Um, and this basically showed that the limits on, um, because we didn't detect any, any variable signals in any of these follow-up observations, we basically rule out superluminous supernovae um, and long GRBs for this particular burst. Um, and I think I'll end here, but um, I just wanted to show the science parameter space for the future of FRBs. So I'm showing on the y-axis localization, how well can each of these instruments localize the burst, versus how much do you actually spend on time on sky to detect a burst. And you can see that the VLA is in fact one of the unique instruments in that it can actually localize confidently every single fast radio burst that it detects. On the other hand, things like MWA, Malongolo, and Chime, they're just gonna clean up the sky for actually bringing numbers of detections to the table. So thanks. So one of your main points was that the FRBs avoid the galactic plane. Uh, but you did mention a population of sources that are just like FRBs. They're called RATs. Yes. And the only reason you call them RATs and not FRBs is because their DM is below the galactic one. Is it possible that you are simply excluding FRBs from the galactic plane because those have a high DM due to the galaxy? Yeah, so that was the point of showing the rats on that, um, that image. There are rats that sit closer to the line of one. You know, the, the any 2001 danger zone could extend below that line as well. Um, and there has been a paper written on that um, looking at um, you know, more detailed surveys in those directions of those rats. Um, I think they, they did that analysis. Um, and showing what the probability is of a rat being an FRB. So I think there was one rat which had like a 25% probability of being an FRB. Well, it's just looking at what the, what the excess contribution of dispersion is really. Can you, can you hide it? Yeah, so there is, there is no clear definition and we haven't really had to make one. You're avoiding the galactic because of this. I, I see what you're saying, but I, I don't think that's true because if we did detect an FRB on the borderline, which we have, there was one, which was just beyond, you know, it, 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 we, we detected one burst from it, okay. It was in the galactic plane. So many surveys were done to follow this up and see whether it was detected again. It wasn't, so that's telling you something. Um, but it was also shown that if you look at the H alpha emission and H beta emission in that direction, you can find ionizing regions in our galaxy which bring it a lot closer. So that, that sort of follow-up has not been done for all fast radio bursts, but I absolutely think it should, even though some of them have such a big excess that you really just can't physically hide it in the galaxy. So um, but you could, still, you could still try to do it. Yeah. 
Uh, is it a very quick question? Yeah, quick one. Maybe a slightly controversial one as well. Um, but on the Keen Burst, you excluded it as being a host because perhaps it's an AGN. But are there physical reasons to say that you can't have an on-access AGN produce an FRB? We, uh, so I may have misspoken. I'm not excluding it as a host. I'm simply showing that the probability that that particular galaxy is the FRB host is not strong. Um, you know, it could, it could be any one of the, the galaxies within that field. There was, in fact, another varying AGN in that field as well, if you read the, the paper yeah, and the yeah, supplementary yeah. material. So, you know, there's, that one is, is likely, as likely as this one. You know, just because we saw a flare, it doesn't mean it's associated with right. the FRB. Um, Sarah, for the, uh, the event, I don't remember the, the number, the, the one where you see the change in the polarization angle. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that change indicative of, or the time scales of a few milliseconds over which this change is, is observed? Is this indicative, if this was a neutron star, of the uh, giving us some sense of what the rotation period might be? Or is that over-interpreting? Uh... I think that would, that would probably be over-interpreting. So the, the rate of change of the, the, the vector really depends on where through the beam you're cutting. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the scale of the, the change is within the realm of what we've seen in pulsars. It's nothing abnormal. Um, right. But I think that, that that would be over, yeah, over-interpreted. Uh,